Well, these days, we don't have too much experience of darkness, do we? Total darkness, at least. Instant electric lighting within our homes whenever we want it, and the lighting of our streets means that the experience of having to endure darkness without being able to do anything about it is pretty rare. It's only on those rare occasions when there's suddenly a power cut that we experience it. And it's then that we see how important light is. Darkness stops us seeing things that we need to see. Darkness confuses us. It provides plenty of opportunities for accidents. And it basically stops us being able to live in anything like a normal manner. And this is why the Bible so often reaches for darkness as a metaphor for conveying what it means to live without reference to God. The God of the Bible is affirmed as our creator, isn't he? And it's this that lies at the basis of its assertion that life can only come from him. Live our lives in reference to God, the Bible asserts, and we continue being plugged in to that source of life, with that life, as it were, being continually pumped into us. Live without reference to that source of life, on the other hand, and the result is the opposite, namely death. Not instantly, of course, but a path of diminished existence that inevitably leads in that direction because we've cut ourselves off from the source of life. And as I say, in spelling this out, the Bible makes a great deal of the images of light and darkness. Life without God, like darkness, stops us seeing things we need to see. It confuses us. It provides plenty of opportunities for accidents. And it basically stops us from being able to live in anything like a normal manner. But it goes further than this as well. Live in darkness rather than within the light of God, and the result, whether we realise it or not, is actually a creeping death. Because we're cutting ourselves off from those life-giving rays of light which alone can sustain us. A bit like a plant that's kept in darkness and basically withers until it's finally had it and dies. But live, on the other hand, in reference to the light of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And we not only see things the way that we need to see them, avoid confusion and so many more of the accidents that would otherwise come our way, but we continue to grow into the people that God made us to be. And that is the Christian life. Trying to walk in the light that God has revealed in Jesus Christ, because that alone can bring us life. And according to that letter of John that we heard earlier, there are several things that this will mean. Walking in the light means acknowledging our sinfulness, the amount in our lives that's shown up by that light to fall short of God's perfect will for them. That's not as negative as it may sound, because it's the root of those sins being forgiven, and then the opportunity for God's Spirit to come and live within us so that more and more of our lives can receive that light and that life that comes from God. But it involves hard work rather than simply coming naturally. If we claim to be in fellowship, in partnership with God, John says, we need to make the conscious decision to walk in that light rather than walk in darkness. And of course, that's got lots of implications for how we lead our lives. And perhaps the most important of these is the decision to love those who share our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the substance of the passage that we heard earlier. It says this, Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother or sister is in the darkness. He, she, does not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. So what do we make of this? Perhaps we don't regard it as that tricky, particularly if we're not conscious of hating anyone, which I imagine might go for quite a few of us here. 
But before we let ourselves off the hook too quickly, we need to remember that throughout this letter, John is drawing very stark contrasts with no safe middle ground. People, according to this letter, as I said earlier, are either investing in life or they're investing in death. And whatever they might think, they're living in either light or darkness. And the same is actually true with love and hate. You see, love in the Bible isn't a feeling or an emotion so much as practical and sacrificial acts of self-giving for others. And the reason why love is presented as the greatest virtue is because the God from whom all life comes is described as being love. Not just doing love, but actually being love. And it's from there that it should start making a bit more sense to us. Because we all know already, if we think about it, that love and life are completely entwined. We see it all the time, don't we? People feeling more alive than ever when they either love someone or they're being loved by someone else. And not just in romantic relationships, in things like deep friendships. Or as parents, for instance, when a newborn child comes into their family, or even an older one. Love, even in the flawed and fitful ways in which we as human beings display it, is unique in its ability to bring life, isn't it? It somehow possesses a power to bring transformation, to bring healing, and to start undoing the most savage hurts and pain. And the Christian explanation of this is because all love ultimately comes from God, the God who alone can give life. Children, or indeed adults, who don't receive enough love don't grow as they should, do they? Their emotional growth is stunted. And once we recognise the life-giving power of love, we realise that it's not an exaggeration to say that not to love is to hate. Because when we refuse to love, we're cutting people off from the source of life. And that's why love is the definitive sign of those who belong to God, the definitive sign of his life and his light, and the definitive sign that those things are within those people showing those qualities. God is love, And if his life and his light are within us, then we'll be people who love as well. And not just as nearest and dearest. The really distinctive thing about Christianity is meant to be that its love is displayed towards people who aren't members of our families or those in our natural friendship groups. Because it's that love that goes beyond those boundaries that is truly radical, that's truly life-giving and is truly transforming. Plus, being the sort of love that makes the most impact on the world around us. Back in 1997, a sociologist called Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity, in which he analysed why this new Christian movement grew so rapidly from the first century onwards. And one of the most striking passages within Stark's book is his description of how Christians in ancient Turkey would react when their town was struck by plague. The rich and the well-to-do, including the doctors, would gather up their family and possessions and they'd leave town. They'd flee to the hills to fresher and less polluted air or to friends and family in towns some distance away. But the Christians, very often amongst the poorest in those populations, and many of them slaves, they would stay and they would nurse people, including those who were neither Christians nor their family members, nor in any way really connected to them. Sometimes those who were ill would, as a result of this care, get well again because not all such diseases were fatal. 
And sometimes the Christians would themselves catch the disease and they'd die from it. But either way, the point was graphically and irresistibly being made to the world that a new way of being human had arrived. No one had ever thought of living life like that before. But now the world was seeing a demonstration of the truth that a love had arrived that could bring life to its fullest extent. And they were seeing a rock-solid example as well of people who believed that unless they chose to actively love those beyond their nearest and dearest and treat them as their brothers and sisters, they weren't walking in the light that they came to have received. And this, according to Rodney Stark, is a big part, perhaps the biggest part, of why Christianity grew so quickly. A movement had arrived demonstrating how love and life belong totally together and it was irresistible to many of those who witnessed it. And it's that same sort of amazing community of love that Jesus came to make possible because of the way in which his death on the cross has set us free from the power of sin. That's where those verses at the end of the passage we had read come in. As John encourages his readers to realise that the challenge to live in this way is possible. It's possible because as a result of what Jesus has done and the forgiveness that they have received, they're in relationship with God who is the source of life and they've overcome the evil one. So just look at these words that John speaks that really is the logic of the whole challenge that he's giving to them that show that it's possible. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. It is a massive challenge, isn't it? I've spoken a lot about unity over the years here at Christchurch, and I've often used this statement from Paul's letter to the Galatians as its basis. Paul says there, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. But it's the commitment to genuine self-giving love which Paul also talks about, most obviously in that famous passage, 1 Corinthians 13, that makes sure that such unity moves beyond the theoretical to something that's genuine and transforming. Jesus came to bring everyone who belongs to him into one single family, where everyone has equal status in him. That's the blessing of Christian unity. That's its privilege. But the challenge that comes with it is the calling to express this unity in meaningful and sacrificial acts of love that powerfully display the light and the life that Jesus has brought us into. So, where might this be for us? Perhaps there's a need of someone else in this church that you're aware of and where God might be calling you to make the difference through some act of sacrificial service. It might be someone you don't know that well or someone who's very different from you. Someone who, if you weren't members of the same church, you'd see yourself as having very little in common with. Perhaps it's someone of a different age or background, but just like those early Christians during times of plague, it's precisely when we respond to such a situation with practical acts of love that we most display to them, to ourselves, and to a watching world that the light and the life of God is within us. This is the last of this short series we've had on things that Jesus came to bring us. The unity belonging to his one family on completely equal terms with all of its other members is a wonderful blessing that comes to us.
but it's also a calling. And it's a calling that centers on the challenge to every single one of us to embody and display God's powerful and transforming love.